I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, neurotropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to the 75th episode of Smart Drug Smart. 75 is kind of one of those nice round numbers that we probably should have planned something special for. But in this case, we didn't. It's just a nice, regular, old Smart Drug Smarts episode about a supplement that could have an effect on your brain, which you would like, creatine. Creatine, which we normally think of as being kind of like a weightlifter's drug, but it turns out that there are definitely some cognitive upsides to be found in this dietary supplement, which is actually something that's part of our normal diet too. Anyway, we're going to have a full-on conversation about creatine with a man who has studied it a huge amount over the course of his career, hailing from the University of Genoa, Dr. Maurizio Balestrino. That'll be in the main interview. If you hang around until the end of the episode, I'm going to give you an excellent way of rationalizing working in a loud, clattering, distracting environment, something which we normally do not think of as being a good thing. But there is a hidden upside, so stay tuned for the ruthless listener retention gimmick. But first, as we always do to kick things off, let's look at This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So this week in Science Advances magazine, one small bummer for a rat brain, one major bummer for mankind, at least as far as getting a human on Mars with his or her brain entirely intact. So they took some rats and they exposed them for six weeks to the amount of radiation that it seems reasonable to expect is floating around in that interplanetary space once you're completely outside of Earth's magnetic field shielding. You haven't made it yet to the magnetic field of Mars and you're just kind of out there in the big empty parts of the solar system where lots of cosmic rays are flying around. Anyway, rat brains did not fare very well in this sort of environment. Human brains, because they're quite a bit bigger, would probably have a little bit more built-in shielding. On the other hand, it would also take, at present technology at least, quite a bit more than six weeks to get a human all the way there. So gamma rays are apparently ripping through brains, leaving a whole lot of damage in their wake. There is a massive reduction of dendritic complexity and significant cortical and hippocampal based performance decrements after their six weeks of exposure. There's also reduced spine density along the medial prefrontal cortical neurons, which are known to be involved with behavioral tasks. They saw this physical damage under a microscope, and of course they saw heavy behavioral changes in the mice themselves. They weren't as interested in objects that they were previously familiar with. They also weren't as interested in newfangled objects that they were just presented with. So basically a whole lot of bad news. Good news if you're a robot and you're looking for a ticket to Mars, because it's looking like robots might be more the way to go for the foreseeable future. It is possible, of course, to protect against things like high-energy particles and gamma rays. The problem is it takes a lot of matter to do that, and it is still really expensive to get matter into space. Getting like a pound of something on Earth up into orbit is dropping in cost year by year. It's certainly the more space travel we do, the more we're bringing that cost down, but it ain't cheap. So bad news, we're a pretty crafty species. I'm not writing us off just yet, but definitely still some issues with getting us off of this particular blue-green chunk of rock. But let's not be pessimistic. I mean, the fact that we're up in space at all is pretty awesome. Nobody said it was going to be easy. I want to throw out a thank you to everybody that's emailed over the course of this week. It's been a pretty big email week. I've almost caught up to getting my inbox down to zero, which is a continuing struggle. It's like, on the one hand, I want to encourage people to email because I love hearing from everybody. And on the other hand, it's like, ah! every time a new ping hits my inbox. But there have been a couple of great recommendations that have come in. There's an episode that we have brewing about drug addiction, which isn't normally something that we really think about in the context of nootropics, but it's worth talking about. It's worth considering. That's coming down the pike as a direct result of a listener email. And would also like to say congratulations, I think, to listener Jeremy Robinson, who tweeted at us that he's, I think just today, it's Wednesday as I record this, about to finish up a seven-day water fast following in the wings of the water fast that several of us did back in February. Hopefully he's about to chow down on some food and get some calories back in the old system. And as I mentioned, we were going to have a drawing among the 10 people that got us up to 100 reviews on iTunes for the podcast, the people that got us over that final hump, breaking the triple digit barrier. Thanks to all of you. The completely randomly selected winner is Matt Gatica. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Who says, a fantastic mixture of reviews, interviews, and commentary, often covering aspects of neuroscience you can't find in your everyday peer-reviewed journal. Sending support from a student in the neuroscience graduate program at the University of Michigan. And we will be sending Matt Gatica his very own Smart Drug Smarts t-shirt, hot off the presses, the first of its kind. It's something that I think our designer did a great job with. I will certainly be wearing my own t-shirt around like a proud father, and we'll put it up online somehow. I'm not 
sure exactly how we'll do that, but if you as a fervent Smart Drug Smarts devotee listener want to have a t-shirt to call your own, I'm sure we can make that happen somehow. So thanks to Matt Gatica, thanks to everyone who has ever left a review for Smart Drug Smarts on iTunes, on Stitcher, on any of those places. It's very much appreciated. And thanks to our designer, Zhang, who does a great job week in and week out doing all the visual imagery for Smart Drug Smarts. And I actually have one more thing I want to talk about right now before we get into the main interview, which is our first ever Smart Drug Smarts audience census that we're going to try to do this month during the month of May. If you go to smartdrugsmarts.com slash census, we've got just a couple minutes worth of questions to tell us about you, tell us about what you like about Smart Drug Smarts, what you hate about Smart Drug Smarts, what you'd like more of, what you'd like less of, your favorite color, your number of brain cells, and things like that that can help us sort of fine-tune what we're doing here so it's as useful and fun as it can possibly be for you guys, as well as for us, and we can all be getting smarter together. So smartdrugsmarts.com slash census. Smart Drug Smarts. So we are going to be talking about creatine, and we're going to be speaking with Dr. Maurizio Balestrino from the University of Genoa in Italy. Dr. Balestrino is a senior researcher in the Department of Neuroscience, Ophthalmology, and Genetics, and he's chief of the Laboratory of Experimental Neurophysiology. And I, I admit up front... I'm never sure whether to say laboratory, which to me sounds like I'm in an old Boris Karloff movie, or laboratory, which sounds like I'm mispronouncing a Labrador dog. So if there's a right way to say that word and somebody wants to chime in and let me know, please do, because I feel awkward every single time I say it. Regardless of my problems with mispronunciations, we'll charge forward into this interview about creatine. Creatine is something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time because it's like you walk down a health food store aisle, you pretty much can't miss these bottles everywhere of creatine monohydrate. It's a really popular, well-known drug for weightlifting, bodybuilding, that kind of stuff, probably well-known to many, many of the listeners. It's been around forever. It is a normal part of our diet up to an extent, but then some people further supplement normally, as I mentioned, for muscle building purposes, but it turns out it's not just good for that, but also for some heavy thinking. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So with no further preamble, Dr. Maurizio Balestrino. Creatine uh, is a compound, a naturally occurring compound, a compound that our body can synthesize and that uh, our body takes up uh, from uh, the food. And uh, it is a compound that is central to energy metabolism. So it is a very important molecule for those cells that have a very high energy requirements. Uh, as a matter of fact, creatine is found in almost all cells of the body, but there are specific types of cells that require very high levels of energy for which creatine is especially important. And one of them is actually the muscle, the skeletal muscle. The other cells are the brain, the neural cells, and the heart, the myocardial cells. A small curiosity that maybe not many people know, another type of cells uh, that uh, require a lot of energy and uh, thus uh, have a great need for creatine are the sperm cells, the male sperm cells, because they have a moving tail uh, that needs to move uh, very fast uh, and uh, so uh, they also require creatine. Creatine in the body helps cells to create and use energy in two ways, basically. The first one is buffering of energy. That is, we all know that usually cells create their energy, which in molecular ways is called ATP, adenosine 3-phosphate, that's the so-called energy currency of the cells, and they synthesize it starting from oxygen and glucose. However, there are times, let's think, for example, of a runner who makes a sprint, an athlete that carries very fast and needs to keep running fast for quite a long time, when there is a mismatch between how much energy the body, in this case the muscle, can synthesize and how much energy it needs. So in this case, creatine enters into play because in the body, creatine is stored inside the cells as phosphocreatine. So uh, creatine and phosphocreatine are two compounds that uh, interchange into each other and are actually in equilibrium. So phosphocreatine seeds to the exhausted the ATP, which is called ADP, adenosine D-phosphate. So phosphocreatine gives its phosphate to ADP and reverts back to creatine. 
In this way, the cell is actually able to synthesize ATP even without oxygen or glucose. Is that related to the use of glycogen? Because it's always been my understanding that first the body will take all the glucose that it has available, and then when glucose is running low, glycogen sort of the next line of defense before finally reverting to trying to metabolize fats. Is the process that you just described with adenosine diphosphate, is that related to metabolizing glycogen? Yes and no. Yes, because glycogen is one more energy store of the body. So when the body needs energy, it also uses up uh, glucose. But uh, the ATP that you can synthesize from glucose uh, if you don't have enough uh, oxygen uh, is very little. And anyway, no, because uh, this is a different uh, way of getting energy. So creatine uh, basically gives uh, energy to the cells uh, when uh, all uh, regular sources, including uh, glucose, uh, glycogen, fats, are not uh, sufficient. Then it uses uh, the phosphocreatine reserve. And this happens anaerobically? Completely anaerobic. In fact, it happens even in conditions like ischemia or anoxia. Uh, there is another role that uh, creatine plays uh, in the cells, and uh, that occurs uh, under normal uh, functioning condition, even in this uh, very moment when you and I are talking to each other. Creatine uh, is a uh, taking care of the energy needs of our cells in a more subtle way. It takes the ATP from the mitochondria and it carries all the way where it is needed. So it is an energy shuttle as it is defined that represents the most day-to-day function of creatine. For this function, the creatine is so indispensable to energy requiring cells. And you mentioned that our bodies naturally produce creatine based on just our normal dietary inputs. When people are supplementing with creatine, how much are we increasing that natural dietary baseline? Well, that would depend on what our diet is. Creatine is not contained in every food. Creatine is an animal-only molecule. There is no creatine in the vegetable kingdom. If you eat only vegetables, vegetables like vegans do, you eat uh, no creatine and you must uh, completely rely on uh, the ability of your body to synthesize creatine. So that's uh, one type of diet that has uh, zero creatine in it. Vegetarians uh, have a little more creatine, uh, eat a little more creatine because a teeny amount of creatine uh, is uh, present uh, in the milk, so in uh, cheese uh, and eggs uh, and so forth. Uh, not much. And so vegetarians have a very low intake of uh, creatine through the food. Then uh, it's a matter of how much meat uh, you eat. A uh, normal person with an average diet uh, would eat uh, probably one or two grams uh, of uh, creatine uh, per day. At a recent uh, meeting uh, in Germany, it was uh, provided an estimation of uh, how much uh, different uh, diets give uh, creatine uh, to the people. And for example, it was estimated uh, that uh, people who live in East Africa and are hunter-gatherers eat uh, two or three grams of creatine uh, per day while the Inuit, who don't eat any vegetables because uh, in the pole you cannot uh, cultivate any vegetables, so they eat only meat, they probably assume four or five grams a day of creatine with the diet. Do you think that it presents a difficulty for people that are on, for example, a vegan diet and are completely reliant on their own bodies to synthesize a baseline amount of creatine? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, the body is uh, quite uh, capable of synthesizing creatine in terms in terms of uh, creatine concentrations, uh, there is uh, not a huge problem with vegan diets. However, it has been uh, demonstrated that vegan athletes have a slightly lower creatine content in their muscle than than omnivore athletes. And uh, they benefit much more than uh, omnivore athletes from uh, creatine supplementation. So in everyday activity, probably no handicap of the vegan diets. And one more thing that has not been addressed in studies yet, but I personally think it is relevant, synthesis of creatine comes to an expense. To synthesize creatine, not only the 
body uses uh, its uh, store of arginine and glycine, which are the precursors of creatine, but also it uses uh, a lot of uh, so-called methyl donors. For this reason, uh, uh, when uh, people rely uh, only to their capability of synthesizing creatine, uh, I think uh, that uh, they put uh, some type of strain on their metabolism, especially in terms of their methylation ability. So when people are taking creatine and looking for cognitive benefits, tell us about the assumed mechanism of action there. What's going on that might make somebody who's interested in having their brain work better interested in creatine? Well, that's uh, something that has been uh, studied uh, to uh, quite an extent uh, in the last few years. First of all, uh, the issue of creatine and cognitive benefits uh, uh, starts uh, from the observation uh, that in those diseases uh, where the body cannot synthesize creatine uh, and the brain cannot synthesize creatine either in those cases because of a hereditary genetic defect, uh, almost uh, the only symptoms uh, that you observe uh, are related to the brain. So these children are autistic, uh, they may even have a difficulty in language development. They may have movement disorders, epilepsy, and so forth. And this demonstrates how important creatine is for the brain. People then have tried to see if a supplementation of creatine to normal persons could increase their cognitive abilities. So we divide those studies into two main categories. In one category, they studied the effect of creatine on cognitive ability under conditions of either mental stress or energy shortage. And then there were studies of cognitive improvement in several kinds of normal people or old people, diabetic people, and so on and so forth. Let's uh, start by saying that in the second type of studies, the benefit of creatine uh, has been uh, sometimes demonstrated uh, and sometimes it has not. When you speak uh, of uh, mental stress uh, or mental energy shortage, uh, uh, we have uh, quite interesting results and I think rather consistent. For example, the research group uh, gave uh, creatine to normal people, then they asked them uh, to uh, make uh, complex uh, computations uh, for half an hour. They found uh, that uh, people who received uh, creatine uh, fare uh, better than uh, people who did not. Not only that, uh, they also found uh, that the blood uh, from the brain uh, was able to use uh, better oxygen than the blood of those people who have not received uh, creatine. How acute is the response to creatine? If I have a mentally strenuous day coming up, is it something where I can take some supplemental creatine 20 minutes in advance or it needs to be two hours in advance or two days in advance? Actually, it is uh, days or weeks in advance. (laughs) One major problem of creatine uh, is uh, that it uh, crosses with difficulty the blood-brain barrier. As you certainly know, the brain is separated uh, from the the rest of the body, specifically from the blood vessels, by a barrier which is called the blood-brain barrier, which was made uh, to prevent uh, unwanted molecules uh, to enter the brain. Those uh, molecules uh, that the brain wants uh, are carried into the brain uh, through specific uh, molecules uh, that are called uh, carriers or transporters. Creatine does have its own transporter, so the brain uh, makes sure that uh, it can uptake creatine from the blood, but uh, this uptake uh, is very slow. So it's not that you take creatine uh, and after 10 minutes you have it in the brain. To be more specific, uh, all these studies uh, have uh, given creatine for days or weeks. And not only that, uh, they also gave creatine to quite high doses. For example, uh, in one of these studies, uh, we are speaking of 5 grams day creatine for six weeks. And the washout uh, is uh, comparable. In in the study I mentioned before, the washout was uh, six weeks. Is that about the upper limit for what somebody would normally take with supplementation? I've heard of people in weightlifting circles taking even more than that. Is there an upper limit for efficacy or safety that people should be aware of? 
Yes, that's a very interesting question, uh, and a question uh, that uh, has received uh, very clear answers uh, recently. In a study that was uh, made uh, in uh, Parkinson patients, they administered uh, 10 grams a day of creatine for four years, and they found exactly the same profile in those that received placebo. There was another study that published last year in Huntington disease patients. Those patients received 30 grams a day for 18 months, and again, no safety concern was raised. The scientific results uh, tell us uh, very recently is that creatine uh, is uh, very safe uh, at much higher levels uh, for much longer time. So back to the studies that were showing the benefits, how strong the cognitive benefits were actually seen? There was uh, a statistically significant uh, benefit, uh, which means there was an effect. We can uh, extrapolate uh, that people uh, like, for example, uh, say university students uh, that uh, in the last days uh, before an exam uh, must uh, study very hard uh, should probably benefit uh, from this. Like This, of course, does not mean uh, that uh, everybody can learn everything in a few days uh, just by taking creatine. Uh, for example, one more thing uh, that was uh, demonstrated uh, is that uh, when people uh, made uh, a similar mental effort uh, after sleep deprivation, uh, again, uh, they felt better if they had taken creatine uh, than uh, if they had not. So probably you can uh, find a benefit uh, by using creatine. I'm uh, aware this time uh, of uh, at least three studies uh, that reach these conclusions, plus an interesting study that um, was uh, published uh, this year. Again, they used oxygen deprivation uh, to stress the brain, so to speak, and again they found that uh, mental tests uh, to these uh, people under conditions of energy shortage uh, were better if they had taken uh, creatine uh, than uh, if they had not. Personally, for both your own diet and those of your families and loved ones, what do you recommend and what do you do yourself as far as creatine supplementation? Probably normal people uh, under normal conditions uh, don't need uh, to supplement their diet uh, with uh, creatine. Uh, they probably received enough creatine with the diet uh, and uh, their body is anyway able to synthesize the creatine they need. However, in special cases like uh, vegan diets, especially if they are athletes uh, and they want uh, maximum performance from the muscles, I would recommend uh, a supplementation with creatine because it is safe and certainly helps uh, those people to have uh, more creatine in their muscles and uh, thus uh, to probably have a better muscle performance. If you go through periods uh, of mental stress, like uh, you must uh, study very intensively for an exam, you get a little sleep uh, for whatever reason, still you must be alert and reason clearly. You go into very high mountain where probably there is uh, little oxygen in the air and uh, still you need uh, to reason clearly and be alert. In this type of condition, uh, probably you benefit uh, from creating supplementation. The problem is, as we said, uh, that you need a long time to build up uh, creatine in the brain. Uh, you must uh, plan in advance for this. So you probably benefit from creatine uh, for at least uh, planning, uh, let's say, one week in advance. Smart Drug Smarts. So thanks so much for Dr. Balestrino lending his time for that interview. It's an interesting one as far as the pros and cons. I mean, it doesn't really sound like there's that much in the way of cons for creatine based on that interview. It certainly isn't an acute onset sort of nootropic as things go. There's that long buildup time in the system before you're really going to see any sort of overt result. And it still may only be a result in the case of really effortful thinking tasks. However, effortful thinking tasks do come along. And I know for myself that something that can help me perform better when in periods of less than adequate nightly sleep or weird travel schedules or weird phone call schedules that make you be awake at weird hours of the night, that to me is a pretty big draw. 
One thing that we didn't talk about at all, but is maybe worth noting, this could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective, is that creatine definitely does make people bulk up a little. It's mostly water weight, as I understand it. Your muscles get bigger, or at least with a, a modest amount of exercise, your muscles are, are more prone to getting bigger than they normally would be. But from what I understand, you're also holding more water in it. Not a huge thing, but something just to be aware of. And there's so much written on creatine in weightlifters magazines and stuff like that. If you're interested in any of those aspects, there's no lack of research out there. But we wanted to know about the cognitive aspects, and now we do. But I told you at the beginning that if you hung around, we were going to tell you about learning in the midst of distraction. And now it's that time in the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So there's already been quite a bit of research on state-dependent learning. Investigators at one point famously showed that scuba divers who learned words while underwater, like writing on you know dry erase boards or whatever, had an easier time recalling the things that they'd learned underwater than they did on dry land. They were underwater when they learned them. It was easier to remember them underwater. Kind of interesting. And apparently it goes one step further than that. Even something that you would think is overtly hard harmful to learning, distraction, is apparently not such a bad thing if when you later need to apply what you've learned, you're going to be in a similarly distracting environment. Researchers at Brown University had about 50 people do a physical coordination test. One of the groups got distracted by having to count letters on a screen at the same time as they were doing the test. People were trained, people were tested, people were randomly selected in both groups to be distracted or not by the second sort of layered task. And the people that only were distracted during one of their phases performed worse during the testing. However, the people that were both trained and tested in a similarly distracting set of circumstances performed just as well as those who weren't distracted at all. So the pleasant takeaway for those of us who like working in a non-traditional work environment seems to be that there can be loud music playing, there can be people moving in your peripheral vision, there can be flashing lights flashing and cabaret girls dancing or whatever it is. And as long as you're going to be executing your work in the same sort of environment that you're prepping your brain, doing whatever learning or research or gearing up, you're not really hurting yourself. You're not really hurting your performance. So the moral seems to be find an environment that you like to work in and just stick with it. Practice, as is so often the case, seems to make perfect. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title twice. Okay, that is the entire episode number 75. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. I always kind of feel like I should say something special, offer some little piece of wit, wisdom, or insight for those of you that hang around until the end. But I'm not sure what it's going to be this week, so you'll just have to uh, bear with me. But I will remind you about smartdrugsmarts.com slash census. So if you've got just a little bit of time to buzz by the website and fill out that listener census form, that would be super much appreciated by all of us here. I will be back at you next week on Friday with an episode about I'm not quite sure what. We really, really tried to get a Mother's Day episode, but kind of got a little bit of a late start on harpooning our experts. So that'll probably have to wait till 2016, but it'll be worth the wait, Mom. All the show notes will, of course, be online at smartdrugsmarts.com. As usual, by the time you hear this, we should have a new version of the mobile app Axon in the iTunes store and an even newer new version coming in the next week or so. There's been a lot of Axon stuff happening in the background, but I will talk about all that soon. In the meantime, please have a great weekend, have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.